Hello! Not getting enough oomph out of your energy drink? Then try an extra strength five hour energy shot. Its beefed up blend of vitamins, nutrients, and caffeine make it the very definition of extra strength. Plus, every grape flavor has zero sugar and four calories. So, for an energy shot that really pulls its own weight, switch to extra strength five hour energy. Oh, could you go left up here? I need to pick up my dry cleaning. For Simon Keith, it is a moment 25 years in the making. Yeah, I think it's this one right here. Good job, Dad. Way to figure it out. He has traveled close to 5,000 miles to see a man he once had no intention of ever meeting. I was really angry because I didn't understand. My thought was, does he think he's going to die? I feel nervous. I don't get nervous either. Are you feeling nervous a little bit? No. It's weird. It's weird. I mean, isn't it? In the next few hours, his life will be altered in ways he cannot yet comprehend. What gave you the right to walk into their lives and rip off the scab? Some three decades ago, this was Simon Keith, youngest of three soccer-playing brothers. Simon was born in Lewis, England, an hour south of London, raised in Victoria, the Western Canadian province of British Columbia. We played everything as kids, uh, with the exception of hockey, and we beat the crap out of each other. I want to get here. I want to be better than him. I want to do this. I want to do this. And he's very focused and very determined on what he wants to do. Self-confidence? Very much so. Arrogance? Yep. Yep. You'll own that one. Absolutely. And there's no doubt. I was a dick. I was competitive ass. Excuse my language. After graduating high school in 1983, Simon had a brief pro stint with the UK side Millwall. Upon his return, a 19-year-old Simon could focus completely on his life's ambition, making the Canadian national team set to compete at the 1986 World Cup. I'm fit, I'm strong, playing well in Europe. It's time, my time, I need to be there. It was gonna launch my career, there was no doubt. Simon had been noticed by the Canadian national team. His World Cup dream seemed within reach. Yet as he trained on this pitch at the University of Victoria through the winter of 1985, something wasn't quite right. Just didn't feel myself, felt tired. My hands and my feet would just go stark white and uh, at some point shockingly white. I didn't want to crush people anymore competitively. I just wanted to get through practice. Treatments prescribed by doctors were ineffective. Simon grew increasingly fatigued. Eight weeks before the start of the World Cup, March 3rd, 1986, came the news that would change his life. Doc comes up to me and says, we've done everything we can. You, you need a heart transplant or you're going to die. Holy shit. Simon had contracted viral myocarditis, an inflammatory disease of heart muscle. If the diagnosis was staggering, the cure seemed unimaginable. Only since 1983 had drugs been approved that extended lives significantly after heart transplantation. 
they can't even say if I'm going to survive or not. But, uh, I mean, I know what's going to happen, and I know that I'll be back. I took a couple of death and dying classes because I was preparing for that happening. You thought he was going to die. A absolutely. Don't, I mean, when someone says you need a heart transplant, what do you think? And especially in 1986, what do you think? Simon did not qualify for an immediate transplant under the Canadian health care system. In the U.S., there was a waiting list of 14,000 people. Yet because Simon was born in the UK, he had dual citizenship and one last desperate chance. Fortunately, we have the ability to go to England and to chase maybe some, some other sort of uh, solution. In June, Canada completed its first ever World Cup appearance in Mexico, losing all three matches. Instead of representing his country, 21-year-old Simon Keith was in England, where he had been put on the waiting list for a new heart. I hadn't eaten for months, um, and frankly, I don't remember it. I needed to survive long enough for a solution. It doesn't matter. You have to survive. Some 160 miles away, on the evening of July 6, 1986, a 17-year-old soccer player named Jonathan Groves was on this pitch in Newport, Wales. He was more of a defender than an attacker. It was just going out and playing a sport and, and, and showing some skill, using that skill to give himself a good time. Around 6 p.m., Jonathan was awaiting a throw-in when he suddenly collapsed. An aneurysm in his brain had ruptured. After being taken to the hospital, Jonathan was placed on life support. You're looking at this inert person wishing that there'd be an eyelid flicker or something like that. But you know, gradually you realize that that isn't going to happen. So I got, talked to his mother and said, I think, you know, we, we ought to turn me the orders. You know, where's the piece of paper? I want to sign it and go away, you know. Jonathan Groves died on July 7, 1986. The next day, Simon Keith awoke from his transplant surgery with Jonathan's heart beating in his chest. My fingers and my toes were pink for the first time in a couple years, and I felt inside competitive again. I felt euphoric. I felt alive. When did you ask, whose heart is this? I don't think that I necessarily asked that. I got that it was a 17-year-old boy. That was it. I was, I was selfish. I need to get out of the hospital. I need to get in the gym. I need to get competitive. I need to return back to Canada. I didn't really think about those around me. That's selfish. My recollection, he was on the treadmill, and he's fighting with the nurses to run. And they're like, your sternum hasn't even fused back together. You can't run. I'm going to make it all the way back. I'm going to be a professional soccer player again. You wanted to play professional soccer again? No, I was going to play professional soccer again. Simon would return to Canada on September 19th, 1986. When are you getting back to soccer? Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Two months later, he was back practicing on the pitch. The next year, in the fall of 1987, Simon Keith made history as a striker for UNLV 
he became the first heart transplant recipient to play competitive sports on any level. On July 7, 1989, three years to the day from his heart transplant, Simon was named MVP at a college all-star game. The next day, the major indoor soccer league held its draft, and the Cleveland Crunch selected Simon Keith number one overall. I'm here because I think that, that I, you know, I worked real hard for it, and, and I'm not even close to where I want to be, so you know, I've still got a long way to go. I grew to hate being the heart guy. I didn't want it to define me. And it did define me to other people. And how did that feel? That sucked. Very simple operation, basically. You know, if you really think about it, it's one in and one out. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. People asking me every day, every time I see people, how's the heart? What's the answer to that? Fine, thank you. To be honest, I'd rather have a heart transplant than a, than a, a blow, blow, blown out knee. At some point, you just want to say, please don't ask me anymore but you don't want to be that polite. <laughs> that heart made possible a three-year pro career, which saw him play for four teams in the U.S. and Canada. It led him to a life with his wife, Kelly, and their three children. When I was little, when we would go swimming, he had a, like a scar, and I just thought it was like kind of cool. I was like, hey, you got a big, you know, what's that? Like, that's cool. And then when he told me, I was like, Okay. I said, tell me, explain it. What's the um, longevity here? What do you anticipate? He says, I'm healthier than 90% of the people out there. I promise you, I will not die. I will not leave you. Simon beat the odds. For only one out of every six heart transplant recipients has survived for longer than two decades. Why had you never asked the name of the family that gave you your heart? I didn't want to know. It's that simple. I did not want to know. It was counterproductive to the goals that I had set for myself. Never having a curiosity. Certainly not strong enough curiosity to do something about it. Then came 2011, the 25th anniversary of his transplant, had Simon thinking about writing a book. Okay, I'll talk to you later. I decide that it's time for me to write down these thoughts that have been rattling around in my head. So I get someone to help me, and he says, there's no other way to sort of wrap this book up is other than you to go find the family and, and talk to them. Did you write to them in 25 years? Nope. Did you pray for them in 25 years? No. Nope. Did you think about them for 25 years? No, nope. I didn't do any of that. What gave you the right to walk into their lives and rip off the scab and make them feel all those feelings that they had 25 years ago? It depends who you are, but the answer for me is, I'm me. I want to talk to you. And I've decided I'm going to talk to you. It's not a popular answer, I get it. It's not what everyone would do. It's not emotional, it's not thoughtful. It's the truth. I was angry, I was really angry, because I didn't understand. It was the polar opposite of everything he'd ever done. It didn't make sense how you would live like this and then all of a sudden change your mind, I want to do this. Yeah, I think it's this one right here. Good job, Dad. And so, on August 1st, 2011, sure you want to do this. Mm -hmm. after traveling 5,000 miles to Wales, Simon and the rest of the Keiths await the opportunity to meet the father of the boy whose heart beats in Simon's chest. I feel nervous, but I don't get nervous either. Are you feeling nervous a little bit? No. It's weird. It's weird. I mean, isn't it? 
This feels like the longest 10 minutes ever, huh? It is the longest 10 minutes ever. Again. Again. <laughs> Hi, I'm Roger. Simon, how are you? Nice. nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Sit. Yeah. Come Thanks on in. You. This is my wife, Kelly. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you as well. <laughs> and, my, and my son, Sean. Nice to meet you. Roger. And my daughter, Sam. Hi. Hi. I want to say something, but I don't know what to say. Does that make sense to you? Yes. I mean, obviously I want to say thank you, but that's not enough, and it's not, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what to say, so let's just kind of bumble along here and see, see, how, see where we go. When, when I read, okay, that you had been a success, um, I, I said to myself, well, isn't that great? Because... Sorry, yeah, have a drink. No, you, you know, you, you, okay, it's, it, it, to see that, that, that the heart has gone um, somewhere and that someone has made use of it, well. I mean, it saved my life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it gave, it gave me everything. It gave me everything. And there's a twinge of, it's not guilt. Guilt's not, not the right word. Somebody died for me to live. I mean, that's the reality of it, right? One of the ways for me to be able to handle the grief was to say, look, life goes on. You've got to go forward. Hours later, they drive to Jonathan's hometown. I've never heard you say you felt guilty before. Well, I don't think I... I tried to not say that, but... I mean, there's an no, element of guilt when you're standing in front of the father whose son's heart you have. Right. And, and he's talked about the biggest loss in his life, right? Was the biggest gain in mine. Was the biggest gain in mine, of course, is the natural part of guilt, right? They stop at the pitch just off Vancouver Drive, the site where Jonathan collapsed. Then, they come to the place where Jonathan is buried. Roger, you said you come three times a year? What days are those? It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one of the toughest moments in my life to stand there. Really tough. And for the first time ever, it became real. It became a person who gave up his life for me. We say thank you to someone who gave you literally everything everything and I think I still know the answer and that is don't waste the opportunity how you doing hey guys Simon Keith is now 50 he and his family reside in Las Vegas medical data suggests that at 29 years and counting he is among the 10 longest living heart transplant recipients we help kids who have received organ transplants, and my goal is to let them know, and their parents know, it's going to be okay. It has been a complete transformation that began with a change of heart. He's more accepting of others. He's more grateful for what he has. He's kinder. Simon has more compassion now. I'm ready to really make a difference, to really be that guy who can change the world. So you are that heart guy? I guess I am. Maybe just on my terms now. <laughs>